Elizabeth I, conqueror of the Spanish Armada, Tudor defender of the Protestant faith, the headstrong virgin queen who refuses to marry. But of all her challenges, her most grueling battle is with another woman, her own cousin, Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots. I am a free princess in that I am not responsible to you or any other. Elizabeth will not face a more relentless threat to her crown or her life. With black ingratitude, she tries to kill me who so often saved her life. Elizabeth never forgives Mary for the fact that she has laid claim to her throne. She never forgets it. So long as I live, there shall be no other queen in England but I. There is no other queen of England but I. Both claim the English throne. Two queens on opposite sides of the greatest conflicts of their time. Protestant and Catholic, Tudor and Stuart, and that most ancient of rivalries, English and Scottish. When rude Scotland vomits up a poison, must fine England lick it up for a restorative? Their combat will last from 1561 to 1587, ending in one final fatal decision. And yet, in nearly three decades of obsession with each other, they will never actually meet. That explosive relationship is played out entirely through letters written with an intimacy and passion that still burns through the paper. Beneath those elegant phrases swirls this dark, deadly current which is going to drag one of the writers down. Here, for the first time on television, dramatized purely from the words of the two queens and their courtiers, is the fatal story of Elizabeth and Mary. No more tears. I will think upon revenge. Would that we, being two queens so near of kin, neighbors living in one isle, should be friends and live together like sisters, then by some strange means divide ourselves to the hurt of us both. I assure you, I be fully resolved to live with you in the knot of friendship, as we are in that of nature and blood. I am glad to hear of your good will towards us and good inclination to peace and friendship. God could not have blessed these two kingdoms with greater felicity than if one of us had been a king and married the other. 1561. Mary Stuart's arrival in Scotland has the two queens brimming over with goodwill. She is 18, Elizabeth 27. The fact that with Mary and Elizabeth we have two young women who are queens is extraordinary. This is not an era of female rulers and now we have two of them and their kingdoms border each other. As two young queens on one island, surrounded by a sea of male rulers, they seem to be drawn to one another. Yet their characters couldn't be more different. Elizabeth's godson, Sir John Harrington, said of her that when she smiled, it was like pure sunshine. But then he continued, he said, anon would come a storm and then thunderous weather would fall upon them all. At one point, she actually broke one of her maid's fingers by slamming a candlestick down on it. Um, she, would, she would smash things. She could say very unkind things. Elizabeth has survived prison and death threats to become queen only two years earlier. Mary has been queen of Scots since she was six days old. She's been raised in the luxury of the French court. Mary loved life. She loved dancing, she loved hunting, she loved sewing, she loved people. She would have danced all night if she could. 
She'd been raised the pampered princess in France. She was very vulnerable. She was volatile. She was alluring, but she was impulsive and she was impatient. And um, these were seen as quite dangerous qualities in a queen in the 16th century. If you're a man looking at this from the 21st century backwards, you think if you want a good date, you're going to choose Mary every time. You're never going to choose Elizabeth. Mary Stuart hasn't chosen to come to Scotland. The death of her husband, the King of France, just left her with no role at the French court. She's sort of unmoored when she arrives in Scotland, and she's got these big, brash Scottish lords who are really not too sure about having this, you know, bonny wee lassie as their queen. To Mary, Scotland must seem like Afghanistan. A mountainous country of feuding clans, warlords, and religious fanatics. She's a Catholic, but many of them are fiercely Protestant. Her indifference is an insult to these men, and will prove to be a dangerous mistake. Instead, her ambition makes her look south, to England and Elizabeth's crown. She has to be forced back to Scotland, and when she's there, when she arrives, she nags on about being recognized as Elizabeth's successor. I am the nearest kinswoman she has, being both of us of one house and stock. As the great granddaughter of Henry VII, Mary has a strong claim to be named Elizabeth's successor. So the English queen has every reason to be wary. If it became known who would succeed me, I would never think myself secure. Tensions between Catholics and Protestants are worsening across Europe. Many people fear that just the presence of Queen Mary could inflame the passions of English Catholics. One reason England had become Protestant was so that Henry VIII could marry Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth's mother. English Catholics had a settled hatred for Anne Boleyn. They always favored Mary, Queen of Scots's claim over Elizabeth. They called her bastardized Elizabeth. In the eyes of Catholic Europe, Mary, the good Catholic that she is, is the rightful heir to the English throne. Catholic Europe could back Mary if she tried to seize the English throne, a threat that obsessed Elizabeth's chief minister, Lord Burley. The Queen of Scots is, and always will be, a dangerous person to your estate. She cannot forbear from her continual ardent desire to possess the crown of this realm. He thinks he's the man appointed almost by God to save Elizabeth from herself. Burley is constantly dripping poison in Elizabeth's ear about Mary. Not to be neglected, trusted nor pardoned. He saw Mary almost as the Antichrist. There was no way he was going to allow that woman to get anywhere near the throne of England. Mary is aware of Burley's opposition. I know how near I am descended of the blood of England and what devices have been attempted to make me a stranger from it. Elizabeth uses elaborate tactics to avoid ever giving Mary a straight answer about the succession. In September 1564, Mary's envoy, Sir James Melville, is sent to speak to Elizabeth to pin her down. But she bombards him with strangely personal questions. What color of hair is reputed best? Is my hair or your queen's the best? Well, which of us is fairer? Your Majesty is the fairest queen in England, and ours is the fairest queen in Scotland. Your Majesty is the whiter, but our queen is very lovely. And who is taller? Uh, my queen is, Your Majesty. Then she is too high. I'm neither too high nor too low. What Elizabeth does is intelligent and subtle. 
She simply does not want to have the conversation that Melville has traveled to her court to try and have with her. She refuses to do it. And what she does is she invokes femininity to simply evade this conversation. And he is climbing the walls with frustration. But then he goes back to Mary and he's not fooled at all. He says, you cannot trust Elizabeth. There are nothing but jealousies and suspicion. But the two women hide their suspicions behind a charm offensive. We shall present to the world such friendship as has never been seen. They seem to compete in their declarations of love. Elizabeth sends Mary a diamond ring, but Mary goes one better. Mary sends Elizabeth her portrait. It's a miniature portrait in a heart-shaped diamond ring. And she sends it with Petrarchan, almost love lyrics. And it's this sort of sense that she's wooing Elizabeth. She wants to meet her. Mary's most comfortable writing in French. Donc, chère sœur, si cette carte suit l'affection d'une voix qui me presse, C'est que je suis en peine et en tristesse, si promptement le fait ne s'en suit. Mary's obsession with being recognized as Elizabeth's heir to the English throne made her easy to manipulate. Elizabeth could deal with this. She's dealing with someone who wants what only Elizabeth can give. It's marvelous. But Elizabeth avoids actually meeting her cousin. Mary was renowned for her charisma, for her charm. It was said that anyone who came within 10 feet of the Queen of Scots would fall in love with her. Now, I think Elizabeth had heard that, and she believed it, and she feared it. She didn't want to like Mary. Having failed to meet and charm Elizabeth, Mary tries a new scheme to strengthen her claim to the crown. Marriage. But Elizabeth is not about to let her cousin marry one of her powerful European rivals. I recommend some fit nobleman within the island. But I declare no child of France, Spain or Austria will be acceptable. And your right and title to the English crown will depend much on your marriage. The root problem is Elizabeth regards herself as the superior queen and she regards Mary as a satellite queen, and no Scot, then or now, would accept that. Elizabeth isn't like other queens. She has little interest in marriage. That would mean handing power to a husband. No husband means no chance of an heir, no matter how much Burley badges her. God send our mistress a husband and by him a son, that we may hope our posterity shall have a masculine succession. I am already bound unto a husband, which is the kingdom of England. As many as are English are my children. If I am to disclose to you what I prefer if I follow the inclination of my nature, I will tell you, it is this, beggar woman and single far rather than queen and married. I think the reason Elizabeth chose not to marry had an awful lot to do with the examples from which she had learned in childhood. So, of course, it's not a great role model, the fact that her mother, Anne Boleyn, is executed by her father. But I think it went further than that for Elizabeth. There have been a number of scandals surrounding her. At the age of just 13, the first major scandal erupted. Her stepfather, Thomas Seymour, came into Elizabeth's bedroom early in the morning and basically, you, know, you might say, he sexually touched her. His wife, Catherine, was actually complicit in this. And there's one occasion described where she held Elizabeth down while her husband cut Elizabeth's gown into a hundred pieces. I could not do with all, for she held me while the Lord Admiral cut it. I've thought about this for over 30 years, and I now think that Elizabeth had probably pretty much decided that she never would 
marry. And I think the reason for this is simply those teenage experiences when she had seen how men could behave. The one exception is Lord Robert, Lord Robert Dudley. And she was in love with him. There's absolutely no question that he was the only man she ever truly loved. My true opinion is that she will never marry. I know Her Majesty as well or better than anyone else. We were friends before she was eight years old. She has always said she would never do so. But if by chance she should change her mind, I'm practically assured she would choose no one else but me. She told me so herself quite openly on more than one occasion. But even love is just a pawn in the Queen's game. Elizabeth is willing to sacrifice Lord Robert. She knows he'll always be loyal to her. If I had ever wanted to take a husband, I would have married him myself. But being determined to end my life in virginity, I wish that my sister should marry him. Being matched with him would remove out of my mind all fear of usurpation before my death. He is so loving and trusty that he would never suffer such a thing to be attempted. Mary is insulted by Elizabeth's suggestion that she should marry Lord Robert. He's not even a very high aristocrat. He's the son of a traitor, and he is Elizabeth's discarded suitor. Do you think it might stand with my honour to marry a subject? Being assured of me, you might let me marry where I best like. And Elizabeth has this sort of weird idea that they will have a sort of menage a trois at Elizabeth's court. I mean, it's, it's very strange. If the Queen, my sister, is pleased to live with me in household, I will gladly bear the charges of the family, as shall one sister do for another. I do mind to use my own choice in marriage. I will no longer be fed with yea or nay and depend on uncertain dealings. The sisterly pretense is over. Mary decides on her own potential husband, an Englishman and a Catholic, her cousin, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. Darnley's actually a really good bet for Mary. He's got royal blood, um, which strengthens her own um, claim to the English throne. Moreover, he represents something extremely unusual for elite women in the 16th century, and particularly queens. He's young, he's handsome, he's desirable. He is the lustiest and best proportioned tall man that I have ever seen. Mary's desire scandalizes her court. The gossip gets back to Elizabeth through her ambassador, Thomas Randolph. She is seized in love in more fervent passions than is comely for any mean personage. Some report she is bewitched. Shame is laid aside. Darnley is but a pawn, but he may well checkmate me if he is promoted. I think Elizabeth was very suspicious of Mary's motives when it came to Lord Darnley, because Darnley too had royal blood. In fact, he was one of the strongest claimants to the English throne. So she undoubtedly saw this as an aggressive move on Mary's part, that she was considering marriage to this man. A Catholic couple on the Scottish throne could attract the support of England's enemies, France and Spain. So Elizabeth simply puts any question of succession on hold. Elizabeth turns round and says that she will not name her successor until she decides whether she'll marry. Nothing shall be done until I shall be married. Or shall notify my determination never to marry. This is heartbreaking for Mary. She feels played. You know, all the letters, the gifts, the petitions, it feels completely wasted. It shall turn to your discredit more than my loss. I will not fail in any good offices towards you, but to rely or trust much from henceforth in you. I will not. She gets up, she goes out, she has a good cry, and then she goes to see Darnley. On July the 29th, 1565, Mary marries Darnley without 
Elizabeth's permission. <laughs> when she went ahead, quite rightly, and married Lord Darnley, Elizabeth was incandescent with rage. Mary can't see the problem. She thinks she's upheld her side of the bargain, effectively. She's married an Englishman, as Elizabeth had wanted. So, what's the problem? You can never persuade me that I have failed you, but you have failed me. I have found your proceedings of late very strange. You forget yourself marvelously. The naming of your husband King shall not give him any authority to do anything. Her Majesty desires her good sister to meddle no further. Mary now has both a Catholic husband and a stronger claim to the English throne. The Queen of Scots is delighted. Suddenly, probably for the first time, Mary really has the upper hand in this relationship. Madame Massa, I understand you are offended without just cause against the King, my husband and myself. Mary's marriage to Darnley doesn't just offend Elizabeth. The Scottish lords are horrified. Darnley, he was awful. The Protestant lords couldn't bear him. He may have had Scottish blood, he may even have Stuart blood, but to them he was this effete, bisexual, beardless Englishman. One contemporary even called him a great cock chick. And you know, this is not the kind of guy that they want telling them what to do in Scotland. He's unfaithful to Mary, you know, from very, very early on. He's a terrible drinker. You know, he's a big whiskey drinker. You know, he, be he goes into un uncontrollable rages. I know for certain that Queen Mary repents her marriage and that she hates him. She is so much altered. Her wits are not what they were. Her beauty, another. Her cheer and countenance changed. A woman more to be pitied than any I ever saw. Once he's married, that's it. He's king. He thinks that she should be a submissive wee wife and do exactly as he tells her. Then comes big news. Mary is pregnant. If it's a boy, he'll strengthen the Stuart claim to the English crown. But some wonder if Darnley is the father or one of Mary's courtiers, David Rizzio. David Rizzio is an Italian musician, and he's Catholic, so of course he has to be a papal spy. He's everything that the Protestant lords can't bear. He seems to have inveigled himself into Mary's intimacies, into her familiarity. Jealous of the influence the Italian has over Mary, Downley goes after him. There are practices in hand that David, with the consent of the king, shall have his throat cut within these ten days. The attack comes suddenly. Darnley and Lord Riven, a Scottish lord, came in. They tried to detach Mary from Rizzio, but she was shielding him. He hid behind her skirts. They dragged Rizzio away and they stabbed him. It was like a cell block shanking. He was stabbed 56 times, Mary recalls. With her friend lying in a pool of blood at her feet, Mary could take no more of Darnley. You have taken your last of me and your farewell. No more tears. I will think upon revenge. She despises her husband now, and this makes her into a decisive, fearsome, strong ruler, the sort of queen that Elizabeth already is, and Mary now seizes the initiative. Fearing that Darnley will try to push her off the throne, Mary writes directly to Elizabeth, asking for support. Praying you remember your honor and our nearness of blood. The word of God commands that all princes should defend the just actions of other princes, as well as their own. For once, 
Elizabeth shows solidarity with her sister queen. She wears her portrait around her waist and she seems genuinely sympathetic towards Mary at this time. Do you think the Queen of Scotland has been well treated? If it had been me, I would have taken her husband's dagger and stabbed him with it. What she doesn't know is that Burley had advanced notice of the Rizzio plot and didn't bother to tell his own queen because he knew that, that, that this would bring about turmoil in Scotland and this would help to destabilise Mary. But on June the 19th, 1566, Mary Stuart does something Elizabeth will never do. She gives birth to a male heir, James. But Mary is still miserable, shackled to her husband. Unless I am quit of the king by one means or another, I can never have a good day for the rest of my life. I could wish to be dead. Elizabeth may despise Darnley, but she never sends a single soldier to defend her cousin. Instead, Mary turns to another violent man. At the moment that Mary is at her most vulnerable, somebody steps forward, and in this case, it's the Earl of Bothwell. Yes, he will, he will help Mary, he will be her protector, but he wants something back. She doesn't know that yet. Bothwell, violently malicious, beyond measure, treacherous, and dishonest as the devil. It isn't long before an explosion destroys Darnley's bedroom, as seen in illustrations from the time. Flown in the air with such vehemence that the whole lodging, walls and other, there is nothing remaining, no. Not a stone above another, but all carried away or dashed in dross to the very ground. Mysteriously, Darnley's half-naked body is found 60 paces from the house, strangled. Many Scots suspect that Mary and Bothwell are behind it. Killing a king is considered the worst crime in the Christian world, with public opinion turning against Mary Elizabeth is losing patience with her cousin. She procured her husband's murder. Bothwell, the chief murderer, was protected by her. But Mary is adamant that she has nothing to do with it. I lament the tragedy of my husband's death more than any of my subjects can do. I had never knowledge, art, nor part thereof. For the love of God, madam, use such sincerity and prudence in this case that all the world may feel justified in believing you innocent of so enormous a crime, which, if you were not, would be good cause for degrading you from the rank of princes. All of Scotland cried out upon the foul murder of the king. Everybody suspected Bothable. Now Bothwell calls in Mary's debt. He abducts her for 12 days and some think he rapes her to force her into marriage. I cannot dissemble that he has used me as I would have wished or deserved at his hand. There are people that have tried to defend Mary who have said that she was raped by Bothwell. I don't agree with that, actually, because the one thing that everyone knew Mary for was that she stood on her grandeur as a former Queen of France. She was not going to marry a man who had raped her. So I think that she was taught round. May the 14th, 1567. Mary marries Bothwell in the middle of the night. They have so little support now. Only a few people attend. The news soon reaches Elizabeth. How could a worse choice be made for your honor than in such haste to marry a, a subject who, besides other notorious lacks, Public fame has charged with the murder of your late husband. Burley and the Scottish Lords used Darnley's assassination to accuse Mary and Bothwell of adultery and murder, declaring them morally unfit to rule. 
She feigned herself to be forcibly taken by him and then married this murderer, giving him greater estates than ever she gave her own husband. She could now be completely rubbished as a woman of any status, any pretensions or rights to royalty. She's a whore, she's a murderess, she's an adulteress. You know, what word do you want? Scots think their nation dishonored, the queen shamed, and country undone. She is now in utter contempt of her people and so far in doubt of them herself that without speedy redress, worse is to be feared. With the Scottish lords gathering their armies against her, Mary realizes she has no chance. She surrenders herself in order to save Bothwell. Perhaps she did love him after all. It basically ends with Bothwell offering to fight the Lords in single combat. At the last moment, Mary stops it. She wants to try and end the thing with non-violence. So she proposes that Bothwell be allowed to escape and not to return. And she will go, we know, with the Lords. Bothwell flees to Norway and Mary is paraded as a trophy through Edinburgh. She's brought back to Edinburgh as a captive, dressed in very ordinary clothes, not the great robes of a queen, with the Edinburgh mob howling at her. Burn her. Burn her. She is not worthy to live. Kill her. Drown her. Or so I'm told. Of course, Burley is, of course, just rubbing his hands with Lee. Now Scotland is in chaos. But in England, Elizabeth is having none of it. First, she throws her support behind Mary. You have a good neighbor, a dear sister, and a faithful friend. You shall not lack my friendship or power for the preservation of your honor in quietness. You don't rebel against an anointed queen. That's a red line for Elizabeth. So she's always going to support Mary against the laws who are undermining her sovereignty. Then Elizabeth threatens war against the Scottish lords. You have no warrant by God's or man's law to act as superiors, vindicators or judges over your prince. Whatever disorders you gather against her. If you continue to keep her in prison or touch her life or person, I will not fail to revenge it to the uttermost. Rather than fight Elizabeth, the Scottish lords imprison Mary on an island in Loch Leven and force her to abdicate. They show her the documents, uh, she reads it through, she doesn't want to sign it, they threaten to slit her throat. If I did not sign this letter, they would have taken me from Loch Leven. And as they were crossing the lake, would have thrown me into it. Or secretly conveyed me to some island in the middle of the sea, there to be left unknown for the remainder of my life. They advised me to sign. For if I did not, They would cut my throat. You don't imprison a woman like that and expect her just to, you know, keep her composure. So they just brutally wear her down. Of course, she also has to fear, she's fearing for her son. You know, what will happen to him? They do, of course, say that, well, he will be crowned king. Mary will never see her infant son, James, again, but she can ensure he'll be king. On July the 24th, 1567, Mary signs the letter of abdication. She is now a queen without a country. Mary was in a pretty bad mental state. It's a reminder of the problem of Mary's character all along. She's not got that kind of quality of, of toughness, of steel that enables monarchs to rule in very difficult circumstances. She panicked, haired off, 
down to Galloway and fled to England. Her Majesty lost all courage and took so great fear that she never rested till she was in England, thinking herself of refuge there. Mary will never return to Scotland. Her last hope is with Elizabeth, a woman she has never met. I am now completely forced out of my kingdom. And driven to such straits that next to God, I have no hope but in you. She believed Elizabeth when she'd offered her support, when she'd expressed her love for her sister queen. And so she took her at her word and the result was disaster for Mary. Instead of a royal welcome, Mary runs straight into a trap. Burley has her immediately placed under house arrest. Burley makes sure that Mary's locked up straight away. And, you know, around her are put people whom he knows are loyal to the Protestant cause and to him. When rude Scotland vomits up a poison, must fine England lick it up for a restorative? From the moment Mary sets foot in England, he wants her dead. Mary tries to meet Elizabeth face to face so she can clear her name. If it please you that I come to you in private, I can tell you the truth against all their lies. When it is proposed yet again that Elizabeth and Mary meet, the English Queen gives the excuse that she cannot meet her cousin because Mary is still embroiled in the scandal of Lord Darnley's murder. And until her name has been cleared once and for all, the English Queen cannot be seen to meet her. If you find it strange not to see me, you will see that it would be malaise of me to receive you before your justification. But once honourably acquitted of this crime, I swear to you before God, among all worldly pleasures, meeting you will hold the first rank. Now that Mary is actually in England, Elizabeth isn't so friendly as Mary realizes. I see how things frame evil for me. I have many enemies about the Queen, my good sister, who do all they can to keep me from her. She's reduced to making empty threats. I have made great wars in Scotland, and I pray God I make no trouble in other realms also. Have some consideration for me, rather than always thinking of yourself. I assure you, I will do nothing to hurt you, but rather honor and aid you. The question becomes, what's to be done with her? And for this, of course, Burley needs some evidence. Burley's spies intercept encrypted letters from Mary's Catholic supporters, which show that they are plotting to put her on the throne. Now, Mary really is a potential threat. Now, whether or not she is trying to get Elizabeth's throne, other people are trying to get it uh, and put her on it. Mary denies any part of it. I never wrote anything concerning that matter to any creature. And if any such writings be, they are false and feigned, invented only by themselves to my dishonor and slander. I am no enchantress but your sister and natural cousin. But Mary's protests fall on deaf ears. The queens are caught up in a battle bigger than themselves. Catholics and Protestants are dying on both sides, in the Netherlands, in France. And what happens with Elizabeth and Mary is that privately moderate, though they may have been, they become polarized as figureheads of two sides in a, a more and more extreme conflict in which their particular conflict with one another has become emblematic. To Lord Burley, the Catholics are a clear and imminent danger. 
Their malice is bent against your person. They will never cease as long as the Scottish Queen lives. Elizabeth refuses to be bounced into executing Mary Queen of Scots. The evidence is not watertight. And also, she has this abhorrence at the idea of executing an anointed queen. Can I put to death the bird that, to escape the pursuit of the hawk, has fled to my feet for protection? Honour and conscience forbid. Mary's held in castles all over England, but she never accepts being a prisoner. Since you have detained me forcibly, if you suspect that I desire my liberty, I cannot help it. I am a free princess in that I am not responsible to you or any other. Months turn into years of confinement. Mary never tires of writing to Elizabeth. Tens of thousands of words demanding her freedom and pleading to meet. Each word scored into her embittered heart. I have written to you several times during the last year to lay before your consideration the unworthy treatment which I have received in this captivity. In her more desperate moments in captivity, she becomes increasingly a prisoner of her own imagination within this claustrophobic world. Mary did start sending small gifts to Elizabeth to attract her attention. Elizabeth had a terribly sweet tooth, so Mary would send marzipan, she would send nuts. She also had a mirror uh, on a chain. She also sent this to Elizabeth uh, as a gift. She's trying to open up a line of communication so that maybe they can work this out. But Elizabeth just stonewalls them all. I beg you to relieve yourself of the charge which I am to you. But things only get worse for Mary. After 17 years in prison, she still hopes her son, James, the King of Scotland, will negotiate her release. Elizabeth had the bright idea that Mary might go back to Scotland and rule jointly with James. Now, young James grew up to be a very effective king. James, who's now approaching adulthood, decides he's going to ditch his mum. The last thing he wanted was a discredited mother back, messing things up and getting in the way. Was there ever a sight so detestable and impious before God and man than an only child despoiling his mother of her crown and royal estate? There is no king of Scotland. Nor any queen but me. What this does is it forces Mary to say, I gotta get out of here. And from this point, she's willing to listen to even desperate plots. Having lost all hope of regaining her crown or convincing Elizabeth to help her, Mary becomes obsessed with getting Elizabeth's crown. I will not leave my prison save as Queen of England. Burley suspects Mary is plotting to have Elizabeth killed and trying to make England Catholic again. So he sends his spies out to get proof. Mary becomes this romanticized figurehead for a generation of young men educated in the Catholic colleges in France, um, in Rome and in the Netherlands who want to give their lives for their faith. It doesn't take long before a young man writes to Mary. Burley's trap is set. Anthony Babington is a young, not very bright, but enthusiastic Catholic gentleman with too much money and a lot of time on his hands. He writes to her and he says that he will help spring her from her imprisonment and at the same time, six gentlemen will 
do the deed. They will assassinate Elizabeth. There be six noble gentlemen, all my private friends, who, for the zeal they bear the Catholic cause and your majesty's service, will undertake the execution. Everyone's waiting. Burley's waiting. Babington's waiting for Mary's reply. And 12 days later, it comes. She basically damns herself in that letter. The affairs being thus prepared, and forces in readiness both without and within the realm, then shall it be time to put the six gentlemen to work upon the accomplishing of their design. Babington's promising her ships and soldiers, and there never were any. There were no ships, there were no soldiers, there were no loyal Catholics waiting to carry her to elegance and luxury and freedom such as she'd known in her childhood. It was all a fantasy, and what's terribly, terribly sad is that Mary still believed it. Burley's spies bring him a copy of Mary's letter, but will it be enough to condemn her to death? I hope that God, which hath given us the light to discover this great conspiracy, will also give assistance to punish it. Any sympathy Elizabeth ever had for Mary is gone. Well, what do you think of your Queen of Scotland? With black ingratitude and treachery, she tries to kill me, who so often saved her life. Now, I am certain of her evil intent. It may be she will not have another opportunity to behave like this. Despite the proof, Elizabeth can't bring herself to condemn Mary. She felt guilty. She felt terrified that God would judge her on the last day for putting to death a divine right ruler. And, you know, she probably felt upset and annoyed that she'd been boxed into this situation that she never wanted to be in, that she had managed to avoid for most of her reign. Instead, she turns her rage on the young plotters. Babington and his associates were hanged on the gibbet. They were cut down while still alive and they had their private parts chopped off in front of them, they were eviscerated, their entrails were burnt in front of them, and then they were executed, and then they were quartered. And what's really gruesome about this is that Elizabeth asks Burley if he could come up with something else, and Burley assures her that if it's done properly, i.e. if they're cut down soon enough so that they can witness their own evisceration, then it would be pain enough. On October the 25th, 1586, Mary is pronounced guilty of conspiring to murder Elizabeth. I am quite ready and very happy to die and to shed my blood for God Almighty, my Saviour and my Creator. So the sentence was proclaimed. But even then, Elizabeth wouldn't do anything. Why? She just wanted it all to go away. She didn't want to be the, the source of the execution of an anointed queen. If it had pleased God to have made us both milkmaids with pails on our arms so that the matter rested between us two and that I knew she should still seek my destruction, yet could I not consent to her death? This is my own personal speculation, but I think she wanted Mary dead. She knew that Mary had to die. But when it came to it, she couldn't quite bring herself to believe that she was the person who was striking Mary's head off. Not fair, not very. Not fair, not very. To bounce Elizabeth into making this decision, she is told by Burley, and this, when I first discovered this in the archives, I could hardly believe it. She's told by Burley that the Spanish Armada landed a year early in Wales. Burley invents a full-scale invasion to push her into signing. The realm will be in great danger principally the person of your majesty. 
Burley tells the Queen to double her guards. Who knows what might happen? She calls for the warrant, and she signs. She signs it after they've been pressuring her and pressuring her to do it, and suddenly it's done. Burley quickly sends off the executioners. But then, almost immediately, Elizabeth acts as if she didn't know what she was signing. I was given a whole pile of papers by my secretary. He should have told me that top of the pile was the warrant for the execution of the Queen of Scots. So she blames everybody but herself. All the time, she's trying to wash her hands of the blood of Mary, but they are covered in it. After 19 years of confinement, Mary is suddenly told that she will die the next morning at Fotheringay Castle, February the 8th, 1587. I did not think the Queen, my sister, would have consented to my death. But seeing that your pleasure is so, death shall be to me most welcome. Do not accuse me of presumption if on the eve of leaving this world and preparing myself for a better one, I remind you that one day you will have to answer for your charge. Mary had decided that she would die a death that would always be remembered. She was going to go for a Catholic martyrdom. If she couldn't win in life, she would triumph in death. Mary may not have had much sense, but what she did have was great style. And right until the end, she kept that up. She's dressed in black. She's got a cross in one hand, a Latin prayer book in the other. There's a rosary around her wrist. I hope you shall make an end to all my troubles. She shows charity to her executioner. She consoles her weeping ladies. Under her outer garments, she's dressed in tawny, red, the color of martyrdom. There's even sort of gallows humor that you get. So she jokes with her executioner that uh, she hasn't had such a servant undressing her before, and certainly not in front of the audience that she had there. I have never taken off my clothes before such a company. In manas tuas domine, commendo spiritum me. 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 In manas tuas domine. The first stroke goes right into the back of the neck. She continues playing, praying, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit in Latin. The second blow goes really nine tenths of the way, but he finishes it off using the axe as a meat cleaver. The headsman picks up the head, as you do, and say, God save the Queen, except that, of course, Mary was wearing a wig, so the head rolls off the stage like a football. In a sense, it's a terribly fitting kind of end, because, like so much of Mary Queen of Scots' life, it's theatrical. And very good theatre this time. In my end is my beginning. In my end is my beginning. That was so apt. She's been immortalized after her death in many ways as the ultimate doomed heroine, the damsel in distress. Also as a figure of Scots nationalism in a way against those beastly English. And perhaps above all, she is the ultimate Catholic martyr. We will never be sure what Elizabeth really felt for her cousin, but Mary's execution marked her forever. This is something Elizabeth never got over. She always denied that she'd been responsible for Mary's death. She lied point blank to James that she was responsible. She blamed her counselors. I would you know, though not felt, the extreme 
pain which overwhelms my mind for that miserable accident. Far contrary to my meaning, I beseech you, God and many more, know how innocent I am in this case. After 26 years of never having met Mary, Elizabeth now finds she's left it too late. History will have to decide who won their battle. It may seem that the winner is obvious. It is Elizabeth. She has put to death Mary, Queen of Scots. She's vanquished her rival in the end. But arguably, Mary has the last laugh because it's her son, James, who becomes King of England when Elizabeth dies without any children of her own, without anyone else to leave the throne to. She's forced to leave it to the son of her greatest rival. Mary's son, James, not only went on to rule both Scotland and England, he ensured that every subsequent British monarch would carry the blood of Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary had shaped history as profoundly as she had affected Elizabeth. Elizabeth was haunted by Mary's ghost for the rest of her days. She could never quite get out of her head the guilt that she felt at putting Mary to death. And it's said that on Elizabeth's own deathbed, the name that she uttered last was that of the Queen of Scots. Would that we, being two queens so near of kin, neighbours and living in one isle, should be friends and live together like sisters, than by strange means divide ourselves to the hurt of us both. <laughs>